Krzysztof Szalewicz. He started his scientific career at our Department of Chemistry of the University of Warsaw, where uh, Krzysztof got the master degree in 1973, PhD degree in 1977, both with honors and habilitation in 1984. Within this period of his career, he also worked as an adjunct research assistant professor at the University of Florida and as a visiting scientist at the University of Cologne. Then uh, from 1985 to 1987, Krzysztof worked as a associate research scientist at the Department of Physics at the University of Florida. And next, since 1988, he started working as an assistant professor uh, at the Department of uh, uh, Physics and Astronomy of the University of Delaware at New York. And uh, since 1990 up to 1994, uh, he worked as associate professor and since uh, 1994 uh, as professor. In the meantime, uh, Krzysztof paid several visits to the Department of uh, Quantum Chemistry of the University of Uppsala, Sweden, and um, in 1993 he uh, got a joint appointment of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry of the University of Delaware. And in 1995 uh, he was a, a JILA Fellow um, at the University of Colorado and uh, next year, uh, ITAMP visitor at Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, uh, Harvard University. In 2002, he became a member of the Center for Molecular and uh, Engineering Thermodynamics uh, at the University of Delaware. And in years 2002 and 2003, uh, he was visiting fellow at, at uh, Princeton, uh, then in, in years uh, 2009 and uh, 2010 uh, at the uh, Laboratory of Astrophysics at the Institute of Astrophysics at Grenoble, and in years 2014-2015 uh, 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 visiting professor at the uh, Nicolaus Copernicus University uh, at Toruń, Poland. Uh, Krzysztof got uh, several honors and awards, both in Poland and in USA. Among others, he became the fellow of, of the American Physical Society, uh, the Palpite uh, lecturer with a series of lectures at the best British universities. And uh, since uh, 2010, uh, he's, the, uh, he's elected member of the most prestigious International Academy of, of, of Quantum Chemistry. So his, his current interests are very broad, uh, uh, starting from weak intermolecular interactions, which determine structure and dynamics of molecular clusters, condensed phases, uh, and, uh, and uh, biomo uh, biomolecular systems. And uh, he also uh, was doing uh, a lot of calculations involving helium atoms, uh, which, uh, uh, and this investigations were used to establish the newest standard of, of temperatures. Um, he was doing predictions of, of, of structure, spectra, and uh, scattering cross sections to interpret um, uh, relevant measurements uh, and provide data needed to understand processes in interstellar molecular clouds. Uh, and many other uh, topics, uh, uh, so, He's got, uh, he has published more than 270 uh, papers, uh, and uh, his uh, H index is very impressive. Let me find it. It's 84. So really, congratulations. That's a very impressive outcome. Uh, Krzysztof, the screen is yours. First, I want to thank you to the organizers to give me opportunity to give my presentation to people in the field I'm very interested in, and which is not really my field. I'm not a crystallographer, but I ended up doing some stuff which I hope is relevant for crystallography. So what we do are predictions of crystal structures. We do it 
entirely from quantum mechanics. We don't use any empiricism, not at all, zero. And uh, at least in some cases, quite broad range of cases, uh, our predictions are reliable and inexpensive compared to other methods which are available in this field. I would like to uh, acknowledge that the most of work was done by Rahul Nikar, who is my graduate student. And this work which was presented actually is based in large extent to other work which was done by my former graduate student, Mike Metz, who was able to make this um, force fitting methodology to be very uh, easy to follow and working really great. And uh, Javier Garcia, who was a postdoc in my group a couple of years ago, who made our programs really fast. So we can do now really uh, large molecules. And this research was supported by Abbey Research Office and by um, National Science Foundation. So since I will be jumping kind of to several different uh, subjects, changing the gears on the way, I wanted to give some kind of uh, overview of what I will be doing. Maybe it will, it will help kind of follow uh, my talk. So um, first, uh, we'll talk, as I already said, about crystal structure predictions. This will be from first principles all the way using quantum mechanics. And then uh, the method which we use to do quantum calculations is an ab initio method, which is called symmetry adapted perturbation theory, which was uh, developed initially actually at the Department of Chemis Chemistry of University of Warsaw, and then development moved to Delaware. And um, I will advertise our new set of codes, which we called SAP 2020. And then, as I already said, this is work of Mike. When you want to predict crystal structures, you cannot do enough of ab initio calculations. This will kill any computer. So what we do, we fit force fields to those interaction energies computed using SAP. And we get something which we call AIFF. So AI stands for ab initio and FF stands for force fields. So those are um, fully first principle force fields, no fitting to any experiments. And the program which we use is called auto PS and PS is for potential energy surface, which is just another name for force field. And then main part of my talk will be kind of divided into two groups. First are predictions of crystal structures for rigid monomers, which is a finished research. We have programs working available to anybody and works really, really well. And then the subject which work now on, which is definitely not yet finished, when the monomers are flexible. Obviously, when monomers are becoming flexible, this is a much harder thing to deal with. So just in a nutshell, graphically, you have a molecule, like say this one, you use Schrodinger equation, and then you plug this into a big computer, and after some time, you are getting crystal structures, exact geometries of some crystal. And you can predict then easily morphology and all the properties of this crystal. Why this is important? Probably I don't need to, I could skip this slide for this uh, audience. But um, crystal structure predictions are important for quite a number of fields. So most important they are for pharmaceutical industries because they have this so-called polymorphism problem. As everybody here knows, polymorphs differ sometimes dramatically in physical properties. So if you uh, uh, look at the story with ritonavir, which was one of the drugs, um, after they started industrial production, they produced produced actually water insoluble polymorph, which of course didn't work at all. It was sold, but didn't work. And then uh, th there was this, um, another um, 
interesting case when for some other drug, one company was able to work around pattern, but just, just producing a different polymorph, uh, which still had good properties and it was not patented. So, and again, something well known to everybody on this figure um, right here, you see that those, um, the same the two polymorphs, of course, look quite differently as um, macroscopic crystal. But the other fields like energetic materials, uh, for energetic materials, knowing crystal structure is important to avoid dangerous experiments. And then uh, when it comes to predictions, they are really very, very interested in density because the higher density, the higher amount of energy per, per density, which is really you know, the main feature of all energetic materials. And I'm not talking here only about explosive for um, uh, you know, military use, but there are several other um, companies which work on different energetic materials of this type. Then the, a big, um, since recently, a, a big customer of those predictions are people who are designing uh, organic nonlinear optical materials. That's you know, things which we have in our pockets right now and uh, uh, very important technology. Then the photovoltaic cells, that's also a lot of work is doing, is done. And interesting enough, in agriculture, when insecticides actually work differently in different polymorphic forms. Um, and in general, what what can say that getting good polymorph por, uh, por, landscape of polymorphs is important in various fields. So here is an interesting examples for um, so-called MTP protein with this name here, where it was crystallized initially in this form, which was called form B. And then they discovered new form B, but the form A uh, disappeared. No, form B disappeared. But in the meantime, they discovered form C. Uh, then they started to produce form C. And then in production, the form D became um, dominating. OK, anyway, enough of this motivation. So one would think that, OK, let's just go ask theoreticians what are possible polymorphic forms of a given structure. And that's it. But in fact, for a long time, prediction of crystal structure was a total disaster. And there was this um, article in Nature by editorial, by editor of Nature at the time, Maddox, who said that one of the continuing scandals in physical science that it remains in general impossible to predict the structure of even the simplest crystalline sol solids from a knowledge of the chemical composition. And this was absolutely true. And it was then later kind of echoed a couple of times, once by Gavazzotti, once by Desirayu. So uh, in fact, the community kind of started to react to this and they uh, started to perform so-called Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center blind test of crystal structure predictions, which means that they provide to the participants just plain structure of molecules, such as shown here. And those structures are uh, everything which people know and uh, crystals are known, but not published. And users are asked to predict this. So it was a complete disaster in the first study. Uh, and then things started to improve. And in the six blind test, which results are shown here, um, the, which was published in 2016, predictions success rate was reasonably good, but you know, but not great. Like for the simplest crystal, it was 57%, but for this ionic salt, it was only 13%. So um 
and the percentage is really percentage of groups which were able to find experimental crystal structure on uh, two lists, which actually are quite long. Two lists, each has 100 polymorphs, and the root mean square deviation on 20 overlapping molecules, ignoring hydrogens, of course, is up to 0.8 angstrom. So the criteria are not very strict. So uh, anyway, the seventh blind test, which is going on still, we are working on publications. We are not supposed to um, tell about the results. Uh, actually, success rate is much lower, but the reason is that organizers gave really, really hard molecules. So the easiest system on seventh blind test was harder than any system on sixth blind test. So going forward, why is this so difficult? It's really like finding a needle in a haystack. In fact, one may say that um, Maddox was really uh, kind of exaggerating, criticizing the field because he was saying, why not to do such simple thing? It's not a simple thing. It's actually very complicated. And the reason is that this configuration space is really vast. It has millions of possible polymorphs, and those polymorphs are reasonable. It's not something that you can completely exclude. And in fact, they are very closely spaced on the landscape of density versus energy. So what I'm showing here is density of the crystal on one axis and lattice energy on the other axis. And this molecule is here, and it's from our recent work published last year. So those are purely theoretical predictions. You can see that even in the lower energy range, the differences are of the order of you know, less than one kilojoule per mole. So very small differences. It's very hard to get this accuracy by theory. And if you go further on, of course, it becomes really, really a dense forest. But we are really not interested in going that high because, um, well, you know, uh, experimentally observable polymorphs have to be within a couple of a, a few kilojoules per mole of the minimum. So we predicted that this actual paper quite well, the exper experimental polymorph. And what does it mean when people say you that, oh, we predict experimental polymorph? So it's taken in the uh, red box, but it doesn't mean that it's exactly like experimental poly polymorph. I remember exactly it was like 0.3 angstrom in root mean square deviation and the density was probably about 20% different. And of course, the experimental lattice energies is unknown for this crystal. Those are known for very, very few crystals. So uh, really experiments should be just the, it just means that this is the polymorphs closest to experiment. That's all what it means, what we do. So our protocol of predicting crystal structure is divided into five stages. So first stage is trivial and probably again known to most of this audience. You get this flat molecule and you have to predict what is the three-dimensional structure. Usually we actually predict not only the global minimum structure, I mean here it's you know, simplification, but we also look for low energy conformers. So as Stage one is predicting monomer geometry. Then we produce the force field. In our case, the force field so far is only based on pair interactions, molecule, molecule interaction or dimer interactions, but can be extended to three body interactions, which we haven't done. We have actually three body force fields, but we didn't apply them in crystal structure predictions. The, this whole thing is of course taking several steps. You generate so-called grid form points, dimer configurations when you want to do those calculations. You calculate interaction energy, you do this analytic field, and then you have an initial force field. And then you go really into true crystal structure predictions. So first, you have to generate this huge number of plausible crystals, plausible polymorphs. This step, step is usually called uh, packing and you have very low criteria for um, filtering the polymorphs. 
basically, you know, in the first approximation, you see if the crystals are kind of consistent with Van der Waals radii. And this gives you tens of thousands of polymers. Some people use even like you know, half a million after this step. And then in the next step, so this step is done by everybody. So it's almost you know universal. We are not doing here anything which somebody else wouldn't, wouldn't be doing. And we actually use other people's programs. And then we do it differently than anything else because in the next step, step we perform finite minimization of those tens of thousands of polymers using our force field, this ab initio force field, AIFF. And we get from this last lattice minimization step, list of polymers ranked by lattice energy. And then we do one more step, which we sometimes can skip, sometimes we do, but we can do refinement, but just doing periodic DFT calculations on some small number of crystals. And this improves with ranking uh, definitely. And eventually after this ranking, we have some polymers and we want to have it observe, observed by at rank one. Uh, I mean, until the, up to this moment, we don't know what's observed polymers. We don't use this information, but at this point we compare and we want to see it at as high rank as possible, which is criterion also of all those uh, blind tests. Uh, in some more details, so what we use, we use mostly programs which were developed, developed by us. So SAPT and this auto PS, I mentioned them already. Uh, in the uh, intermediate step, we can use basically any program, but then in the step of fine optimization, we use a program UPAC by, by Van Eyck which we modified to work with our potentials. And then at the last step, we can use any periodic boundary condition code. We use Quantum Express or VASP. Okay, so now I was using many times this name SAPT and perhaps some people became curious what SAPT is. So it stands for Symmetry Adapted Perturbation Theory, which is just a method of solving Schrodinger equation. It starts from two monomers, which are far apart and which are so-called zero order uh, approximation. Then interaction energy is calculated directly by perturbation theory, starting from those unperturbed monomers. And what is this name symmetry adaptation? It means that we are enforcing Pauli exclusion principle. So naturally, if you have two isolated molecules, there's no exchange of electrons between them in Schrodinger equation. So in this method, this has to be kind of put into theory. If you do, say, Hartree-Fock calculation for the whole system, exchanges um, of electrons is uh, basically part of the game from the very beginning, but here it has to be imposed. And then nice feature of this method is that if you remember any physical chemistry course, there's always a chapter on interaction energy and you learn this about electrostatic uh, induction, which we call induction, but people usually in your field call it polarization and charge transfer, the special energy and exchange terms resulting from the symmetry adaptation. So uh, uh, we calculate each term directly. We People do, there's man, many people who are performing so-called the composition of interaction energy. We don't do it. We have uh, interaction energy decomposed from the very beginning. So as I said, SAPT is the theory of intermolecular forces that everybody thinks when people think about intermolecular interactions. We use a particular version, which is called SAPDFT. And SAPDFT just describes monomer using Consham DFT and time dependent DFT, but interaction energy are computing using wave function theory. So it's essentially wave function based theory. We have good theoretical explanation why this works. So, advantage of sub DFT is that it has pretty low scaling comparing to, say, coupled cluster method with single, double, and non terrestrial 
uh, triple excitations. So our metal scales like N to the fifth and CCSD parenthesis scales like N to the seventh. So this means if you increase system size by factor of two, our method will be two to the fifth small time consuming CCSD of T will be two to the seventh time more time consuming, which is a huge difference. So we can do much larger systems. How accurate is SAPT? Uh, so I was showing before some uh, results, but uh, now I can just quote my good friend, David Mitcha, who published this book on thermolecular interaction. And you can see where he puts SAPT, puts above CCSD parenthesis T, which is actually nice, but not true. Actually, usually we trust CCSD parenthesis T results more than SAPT, but they are close. Okay, so SAPT is available online. Everybody can uh, download it. We are actually some of the pioneers of uh, distributing programs to anybody who wants. We are part of one of the first distributions of quantum chemistry programs called MOTEC, which where we added SAPT in 1993. Okay, so uh, this page includes also this auto PS program that we use extensively in this project. So what is this auto PS? So you have a number of points right here on the simple case of just one dimensional curve and you want to get information in between points. So instead of calculating more, point, more points, we can just fit those points that you already have and predict the interaction energy. So this is force field or potential energy surface. Uh, and you really have to use it in case of any simulations of matter because direct approach, which is used, and people do use direct approach and do calculations every point is needed, but it is terribly time consuming. Um, so, those simple analytic functions, potential and surfaces, force fields, or the, define them, uh, are really a must to go. But getting such a surface is not easy, and we did a lot of this kind of case by case, and it was taking months of human effort for more complicated systems. Now, AutoPS makes it completely uh, automatic, so you put user prepares just monomer geometry as input. That's it. It has to be you no know, three-dimensional good monomer geometry, not this 2D one. And then you have like two lines in our approach. One line is asymptotic line. You calculate multiple expansion. So the, those things that Anna was just talking about, you calculate asymptotic interaction energy. And what we get is basically a huge fraction of the whole surface kind of for free because those calculations involve only one single calculation for monomer. But then we of course have to do calculations for closer distances and this is on a set of grid points. Uh, we use ORCA as our front-end program, then SAPT, and we eventually get close-range energy that are fitted by some uh, analytic functions. And again, all of this is completely automated. And at the end, you just get force field, which you can use. The auto PS is not only an pro important program due to this automation, but we also developed a couple of other things while writing this. This way of approaching asymptotics involves a new, new theory. We have new methods of generation, generating of grid points and also the potential energy surface, the analytic forms are different than people used before. Okay, so um, I already said that this middle step is UPAC band van Eyck, and that we use modified UPAC for our finite optimization step and then popular DFT programs for this um, re-ranking refinement. So we published a paper recently, uh, actually last year. We took 15 molecules, which are given here. They have 18 known polymorphs. And I think we were really successful because final result was that experimental polymorph was always ranked as number one 
in all 15 cases. And as I said, we didn't know what, I mean, we, we knew those are known crystals, it was not blind test, but we didn't use this information through the whole process until the very end. And also it has, uh, uh, three systems have um, uh, poly, uh, second, uh, have another polymorph known and they were also ranked very high. So you can look at um, overlaps. So the overlaps are showing how this predicted crystal overlaps with experimental one. And here's one example, which is, you, you may recognize molecule, which I have already shown. It's one of the target molecules, molecules 22 from six blind tests. And for this test, uh, it was the easiest molecules, 57% uh, success range. Um, but only 17% of groups predicted it as rank one and lowest RMSD was 0.3. And now we have it at rank one and it stays at rank one after uh, those periodic. So we have it at rank one already using only force fields. Then after this periodic DFT, it stays at rank one and RMSD is like twice smaller than the best RMSD in six by test, which is actually uh, from our group. This we, we got, we participated in six by test and we got the lowest RMSD on the system. Okay, so now I'm, one may ask, okay, so fine, you have a method, but how it compares with using standard generic force fields. So we looked at um, probably the kind of best competition from the force field, so-called Williams force field, which was actually optimized for molecules like this. So if we have taken force fields like GAF or, or PLS, the result would be worse because they were not optimized on such crystals. And this force field is not bad. I many people use this force field, very popular force fields. And if you look now at this picture, so what I show here is that uh, the bar means percentage of molecules which are given rank. So one is rank one. So we obtained in our predictions only with potentials, only with force field, because later when we included, um, uh, when we included uh, periodic DST calculations, all of them, 100% was at rank one, but using force field, because no, that's a fair comparison force field with force field, uh, we had, um, about almost 30% and force field did predict one molecule at rank one, this Williams force field. Uh, but then if you go further on, basically for rank less than 10, we have almost 100% and 100% for rank below 20 only with force field. And this grows very slowly and gets to 80 something percent only at rank 100, it has a rate of 70%. And for a couple of crystals, this force doesn't work at all, which means, you know, it's impossible to reach 100%. Okay, so that's the comparison. And perhaps even more important com comparison is kind of price performance ratio, because we are not the first group which who can predict such crystals. In fact, there are two very successful industrial companies which do those predictions for many pharmaceutical companies and they can do it very well. The way they do it is that basically they use this periodic DFT and they use huge number of calculations, huge numbers of computer time. So some people now say, well, with those costs of those predictions, perhaps it's just better to do experiments. It's cheaper and takes less human human uh, cost and computer and you know and say uh, amounts of energy but anyway so i compare here here a couple of methods method number one is our new crystal structure structure prediction strategy where we have this um, um initial force fields and periodic dft only on 20 polymers, so it's fairly cheap. So here is this thing shown as, I have time and various stages and how much time does it take? So time is, you can see very small. You can 
then do say uh, forces like this Williams forces who have then 70 percent 72 percent success rate you have to use 100 structures and therefore the cost of DFT calculation becomes now much higher and then you can go which some of those groups do is that you have brute force strategy, strategy you have this empirical force field minimization you but you use a lot of those generated crystals and then you have um, to perform periodic DFT on say 25,000 polymers which of course is very time consuming of course this is not a practical method people put some restrictions but still they use huge amounts of time okay so going forward we have um, some uh, questions in the initial stages so first issue is that those ammunition force fields have some fitting errors and uh, really you may say why we have those sub dft forces which are definitely more accurate than dft plus d but we still have to use this periodic dfts and the reason is really could be two, two reasons one those fitting errors and uh, another many board effects so we investigated both i will not talk about it more the thing is that we were able to get uh, those fitting errors under control by a fairly simple procedure which adds some computer time but not much basically the same amount of time that it takes to do periodic dft calculations that we generate some crystals and then we pick up nearest and second nearest neighbors from those crystals theoretical crystals and use it to improve potential so that was one thing and then we basically don't need to do this periodic dft step anymore and many body effects well i did a lot of work on many body effects so it's kind of uh, i don't feel good to say that it works without many body effects but we analyze it it seems that those are not large we have in our plans to in, in, include many body effects but this will be future research so to summarize this part i wanted to say that uh, main kind of points are that our method works is that those sub dft interaction energies are accurate nearly as accurate as ccsd parenthesis t at a fraction of cost and in particular with our new efficient codes the calculations are taking reasonable amounts of time then we have this auto ps which is kind of machine learning artificial intelligence program which uh, not only is fully automatic but really provides orders of magnitude cost in development because it uses small number of grid points use asymptotic information the grid points are sampled in an efficient way so we use uh, so for smaller systems with this small, a lot of potential developed by other groups people usually will have 100,000 points we can develop potential for the same system with 1000 points which means much less cost of uh, initial calculations uh, on the other hand after we get our initial force fields they have uncertainties basically order of magnitude smaller than empirical force fields like say opls or gaf or other force fields or even the williams force field while the cost of actual crystal predictions are you know not much different may, 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 may be factor of too large due to more involved fitting functions and then uh, we do this uh, re-ranking with periodic dft which we know works well but we use only 20 polymers and we do no geometry optimization so this is really kind of fixing some imperfections of in our initial force fields and as i said uh, this periodic DFT step can be replaced with uh, this uh, clusters cut from crystals what we call this refinement which I described briefly okay so now let's go I don't have much more time but um, I don't need much more time this work is still ongoing we have some successes which I will show and we are fighting with some problems 
So now we want to go to flexible monomers. And this is <coughs> like, you may say, impossible. Because if you have rigid monomers, the potential energy surface is only exactly six dimensional, whatever the monomer is. Now you have internal degrees of freedom and you have, you know, for 100 atoms, you have uh, 300 minus six degrees of freedom. So this would be needing like, if you have K points per dimension, you need K to 294 grid points, which is of course way <clears throat> too much to do at any time, anywhere, not in any foreseeable future. Uh, so one way which we haven't tried actually, but we have it in auto PS is to consider only flexible degrees of freedom. And we can develop potential and surfaces with just a couple of flexible degrees of freedom. And this is a possible way forward, uh, but we haven't tried it for crystal structure predictions. So one way which people say, okay, let's just take empirical force fields for only intramonomer part. So you take ab initio force fields for interaction between monomers and <coughs> empirical for uh, for the uh, interactions within monomers. But this is really hopeless. So this is just a very simple molecule. And what I show here uh, is OPLS force fields, which are those black dots, ag predictions against uh, DFT plus D3 energies, which are are quite reliable for the system. It's just total energy of this system with minimum shifted to zero in both cases. So you can see that the black um, dots are completely unrealistic. They are not even on X equal Y line, but they are kind of in strange, um, have strange distribution. So then uh, the other things are from our partial improvements of this force field, and you can see you can improve it. And I will talk about it in a second. So is it hopeless? Well, you may think it is hopeless, but in fact, the thing is that you only need bottom of the potential in the surface. So here is one molecule for which we saw all possible polymorphs. And all the polymorphs are within like, 3.5 kcal per mole, 15 kilojoule energy. So, and there are no other polymorphs there. So of course, crystal structures change uh, the uh, structure of polymorphs, but everything is in this low area of energy. So this means you need only to know the bottom of potential energy surface. And you know, this bottom of potential energy surface is dependent only on uh, soft degrees of freedom because if you change any chemical bonds, if part of any chemical bonds, you are going way up. So this is like for the same molecules, we show how the uh, force fields um, uh, uh, describe the rotation around this degrees of freedom, assuming that we can still use those uh, empirical force fields. So the uh, black, squares are ab initio data. Green is our feet, which I will mention in a moment. But what's important, the red line is OPLS. For this system, PLS is quite good. It doesn't um, um, predict that there are like double minima, but by and large, it's not bad. But if you go to another system, it's a disaster. OPLS is this black line predicts minima in completely, completely wrong ways, wrong places, GAF as well. So for this system, obviously you will get nonsense if you use empirical force fields for. So definitely empirical force fields are not the way to go. And I think I am. I have to skip a couple of slides. So this slide describes how those empirical force fields are uh, constructed and how we change them. So uh, after those changes, this is the same graph again. So the blue points are our reparameterized potential. And you can see in particular at near zero, which is the most important region, it makes some sense. And indeed, we performed predictions for this crystal and we got very good predictions. Rank two and for polymorph two, rank 
17, and this is without periodic DFT. So I would say not bad. But um, then we move to another crystal, which is much more difficult. In fact, we found out it is quite difficult. And this software which we used for the previous crystal, which is called Joyce, failed completely because it predicts that internal uh, the, the monomer kind of fuses one part gets into another so we move to another crystal and to another software it's called qforce and this qforce so this um, uh, right hand graph those those two graphs are with qforce qforce works quite well and we don't have yet predictions with uh, of crystal structures. I mean, we have, but they still don't work too well. And, uh, but uh, it looks like it will be the method which will go. So in summary, we have those ab initio force fields based on sub DFT. We can deal with up to 100 monomers. We have auto PS, which redu um, um, reduces the cost of potential development. And then we, this method works very, very well for rigid monomers. Extensions are, I mentioned many body effects, and then flexible monomer crystals, um, which hopefully we will have success soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for, for your brilliant lecture. And now we will have uh, some questions and comments. In fact, there are some on chat. We already have a discussion going in the chat. Yeah, so, the, yeah, the, so the first question was, uh, why you are using all these steps to predict structure when uh, X-ray diffraction can give it easily and give the position of surrounding molecules? Yeah, so, so this is, this is what, what I said at the very beginning, is that um, in order to perform X-ray diffraction, you have to have uh, crystal crystallized. So... Uh, in uh, many cases, you want to know properties of those crystals before you crystallize it. Like for pharmaceutical industries, you know, they will find some polymorphs. The polymorphs is okay and may have, you know, good um, uh, pharmaceutical properties, uh, medical properties. But then there are other polymorphs which they have not found. So they, for pharmaceutical industry, the main purpose of those kinds of uh, theoretical prediction is to find out if there are um, kind of plausible polymorphs, which perhaps will be later created either during industrial process or uh, by just by aging. The, polymorphs can recrystallize to another form or by a competition which will find another polymorphs and patent it. So that's one example. Um, uh, the, 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 the same is true, for example, uh, there's a nice paper um, which actually we collaborate with Mark Tuckerman group of from NYU and they published a very nice paper when they uh, worked with some people in agriculture and they actually predict some insect size, which, you know, uh, experimentalists are trying to um, synthesize now to crystallize where hopefully they will have, you know, um, better uh, properties of killing uh, various mosquitoes <laughs> and other bugs than the current thing. So so, so the reason for doing all of this is that uh, a lot of things in crystallography can be done if you know a priori which crystals uh, are possible to synthesize. Mm -hmm. Also, Eric Rakowski uh, has helped you to, to answer this by writing this nice discussion on chat. And um, here are his uh, arguments that quite often you, you can have big troubles 
trying to obtain single crystal um, XRD quality crystals, electron diffraction can possibly save you, but electron uh, diffractometers cost uh, three times more than a pretty good single crystal XRD instrument. I wouldn't say so if I think about synergy. Um, not all samples uh, can withstand electron beam, however. Secondly, uh, give, give it easily is a question uh, mark. Not always. Disorders, diffuse electron densities, twinning, especially uh, meroedral, uh, because it cannot be readily uh, seen in reciprocal space, uh, displaying utilities, modulations, OD structures, uh, quasi crystals. So uh, there are plenty of uh, such um, extra phenomena. And uh, three, uh, sometimes you want to explore possibilities. Example for polymorph uh, preparation. So it's exactly the, uh, the same or similar arguments uh, as, as you were showing. Um, yeah, and, and one, 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 one more uh, application of this is actually from this. Um, seventh blind test, which as I said, is still ongoing. So for one of the targets, uh, which is important uh, for actually pharmaceutical industry, they have um, crystallized two polymers, which they were able to resolve. But they have also eight polymers, which they were not able to resolve. So if they look for this landscape of theoretical polymers, they can actually um, uh, take you know a couple of low energy polymers you know say rank 0 to 20 and uh, calculate those um, uh, pxrd uh, uh, spectra from theory which is trivial and compare with what they have from experiment and they will at least see if it looks like you know this is a crystal structure or some mixture which you know cannot be really ever described by, never resolved. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Eric, uh, for, for your help. Paulina, maybe the next one. The question is from Biswati Mohanty. How is your proposed method better than the conventional methods, such as swarm optimization and evolutionary algorithm-based methods? Um, actually, that's, uh, uh, our method is not better or worse, so we can use it with any optimization algorithm. We actually have chosen to use it with this uh, kind of uh, more classical way of generating crystal, UPAC, but we can connect it to any package, basically, to any package which uses false fields. So, so, um, so far, UPAC was sufficient for us. We didn't feel that in any case we were not able to make predictions uh, because of limited sampling of the space. But certainly, there are better methods than UPAC, and uh, at some time, we probably will move to better algorithms. Thank you. And next question is from Hans Bitbirgi. How does your approach differ from the one developed by uh, Marcus Newman at Avantgarde Materials Simulation? His approach seems to be very similar. He starts also with molecule specific force field uh, from quantum calculations. Yeah, so there's similarities and differences. Actually, uh, Mar uh, Marcus' approach is is right now the best. He is the leader of the field. However, it's also very costly. Uh, it uses enormous computer resources. So how it works? It is similar, but at the same time, not similar. So they take an existing uh, empirical potential. I believe it's UFF. And then they perform uh, same kind of uh, crystal structure generation as we do, and then take a number of those structures into periodic DFT as we do, yes. So and up to this point, it's kind of similar, except that they use generic empirical potential and we 
uh, use this ab initio potential. And then they do uh, something which is different, which we don't do. They do geometry optimization in periodic DFT, which of course is much, much more time consuming than single calculation. We only do single calculation per crystal, single geometry calculation. So they do geometry optimization, they get some sensible crystals, and then they take this force field and during this geometry optimization, they do it for a couple of polymers, for some number of polymers, not couple, more than couple. Uh, they were able, they refit this force field to the results of periodic DFT. And then they do it in a couple of iterations and it works very well. I'm no, I'm admirer of Marcus' approach. It works very well. We are when we are starting our work, his approach was non-existent. So, so then it came, and uh, we are trying now to get approach which will be as predictable, and it is actually for rigid monomers, uh, but much less costly. Yeah. Thank you. Second part of, of Hans Bet's uh, Hans Bet questions. Other than Hoffman and Kulashova, 100% uh, empirical force field uh, recently published in Acta Chris. What are the differences between your approach and the one uh, by Hoffman and uh, Kuleshov, uh, Kuleshova? 100% um, uh, empirical force field. This is meant as a continuation of, of ah, oh, I see, okay. <laughs> so, so uh, continuation of Marta's Dudek question. So firstly, let's ask uh, the question, what is your opinion on uh, our possible future of uh, inter um, artificial intelligence? Uh, artificial intelligence. Ah, ah, ah. Okay, yeah. so, um, so far there were a number of papers and I've read some of them with AI predictions for crystals. And for organic crystals, it was not working too well so far. In fact, you know, um, uh, my collaborator, Mark Tuckerman, is doing a lot of work in this field. Uh, so they did it for seven blind tests and it worked so so, although it was really of great interest by many people because it was a very innovative method. On the other hand, there was this uh, new article uh, in Nature by meta people who are able to predict using AI uh, many hundreds of uh, crystals of, of small inorganic molecules, actually mostly atomic crystal, uh, like, you know, crystals used for all those um, materials in uh, solid state physics uh, uh, for you know, semiconductors, superconductors and so on. And uh, this was very successful in the sense that they predicted few hundreds of materials which without you know uh, putting them in, few hundreds of materials which are already known as important materials and they predicted uh, another about the same number of crystals which they think people should think about and crystallize. So who knows, maybe this method will be applied to organic crystals and will work. Uh, maybe it will not work, we'll see. Uh, uh, and um, even then, you know, our methods probably will be of use because you still often need to refine those crystals predicted by artificial intelligence. In in fact, um, in this um, there's this famous artificial intelligence uh, program AlphaFold, which predicted a lot of uh, crystals or structures of proteins, and uh, one of the um, current research direction this field, which I, I'm not doing, is that people are now taking those structures and refining them with kind of classical methods. So we'll see, we'll see what will happen uh, in artificial intelligence predictions for crystals of large organic molecules. 
Yeah, so, and there is a continuation of this uh, question. Um, uh, what, uh, in your opinion, is a possible future place of artificial intelligence in CSP, other than Hoffman and Kuleshova 100% empirical FF uh, force fields, uh, field recently published in Acta Chris? Uh, I unfortunately don't know this paper. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it's I mean, the other thing which is done with what well, it should be called artificial intelligence, but machine learning is that people obtain machine learning force fields, but they are usually fitted actually to initial results. So this is something very similar to what we do, but instead of having some simple analytic function, uh, people use say neural network and obtain a fit to a set of uh, ab initio data. Um, I'm actually kind of in competition with such method in another field in which I work. So I also produce very accurate potentials for systems like water or say ammonia. We are try trying to predict properties of condensed phases of those systems and also spectra of Van der Waals molecules of those systems. And people do a lot of um, uh, machine learning produce a lot of machine learning potential in this field. This is kind of established already method. The main difference is that we are getting as good potential with say 10,000 points and they, as they are getting with half a million points. So our work is way uh, uh, cheaper in terms of computer time and also in terms of simulations. If you have neural network potential, actually neural net networks in simulations are not that fast. They are not as fast as empirical potential. It's at least factor you know, between 10 and 100 uh, difference. Yeah, and uh, then uh, Hans Bett is uh, asking about the reference uh, to the Nature paper you have just uh, mentioned, but uh, I'm sure it can be easily found in, in Nature. Yeah, uh, just Google meta predictions of crystal, something like this. Mm -hmm. And there is a next question from Michał Chodkiewicz. Actually, Michał has stolen me my question. Um, uh, are there methods which works for disorder crystal structures? That's another excellent question. <laughs> so uh, again, something which I learned uh, at the seventh blind test. So as I already said that they um, included very, very hard monomers and um, success rate was low, except for actually Marcus group, which did fantastically. And there's also another group in China, Extol, which really uses his methods and they also did very well. But academic groups didn't do well. <laughs> and, um, but uh, part of the problem was that it turned out later, you know, after the uh, structure was submitted, the several of uh, uh, experimental structure were disordered. And really it was not clear what to do with this. And within this test, uh, it was not our group which did it, but we could do it as well. Uh, theoretical calculations were used to analyze this disorder. In fact, no, uh, uh, you know, you have X-ray spectra. You don't know if there's disorder. I mean, you, you may suspect, but you don't really know. I mean, you guys know better than me. And then one of the, the groups said that their calculation showed that this crystal is not uniform, it has significant disorder. And then experimentalists went to the results and they said, OK, you are right. Yeah, that's, that's what I would love to learn for ICE, but uh, that's my um, uh, say favorite topic. Um, anyway, uh, is anybody, has anybody ever predicted a structure of quasi-crystal? Not to my knowledge. I, not to my knowledge, but people were doing amorphous crystals. Mm -hmm. So, so again, we haven't done this, but I know work of other people. In fact, about for water, water has those amorphous uh, condensed phases and people are trying to model it then. But how about structure of, of uh, 
what I mean, they are this low density water, uh, high density water, and th there are suggestions that there could exist also like intermediary uh, density water. Uh, exactly, exactly. So, so this is something which we have in plans. Uh, I have a student working on it actually, but we have no results. But people did uh, simulation of those phases using uh, empirical potentials, like you know, better empirical potentials like, like tip for P2005 or something. And um, I would say that uh, at this point, those calculations were not, conclu not conclusive. And there's also, you know, in this context, there's this hypothesis of uh, water consisting of two phases, uh -huh. and uh, which, if it works, it should actually kind of uh, explain experimental observations on some of the phases. This was never uh, confirmed by uh, simulations because in simulations, I mean, if this is true, you should be able to analyze the structure from MD simulations and find out some fingerprints of this. And there were papers doing this, I would say they were inconclusive. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So you showed that you uh, um, initial force field, which is uh, design uh, like kind of tailored made force field for each molecule independently, right? Yes. Uh, but how this method or how it could be transferable, how can you apply it, for example, to uh, work or predict interactions of small molecules with proteins or small molecules with nucleic acids? Can you actually, somehow uh, design it for bigger molecules also? Yeah, so uh, actually I had a student working on it. Unfortunately, he went on a, a leave of absence, but hopefully we will resume. So um, for crystals, uh, we don't plan to do any kind of generic force fields, generic ab initio, but then transferable to other molecules. Um, I am skeptical about possibility of doing this. Uh, we could think about improving, say, Williams force field base of ab initio data uh, and other kind of things, but uh, this will be really a different type of approach. Uh, but for uh, uh, biological systems, so this project that my student started to work on is as follows. The idea is as follows. So let's say we want to uh, predict folding of small proteins, like really large polypeptides, say consisting of maybe 50 amino acids. And there are experimental data for this. And in fact, David Show Group published a couple of years ago, successful predictions for those systems, but with kind of they had to uh, make also some kind of specific potentials. They had to improve very much uh, generic force fields to get those results. So what we want to do, so of course we cannot do whole uh, interaction of protein, mainly because of the uh, flexibility of this molecule. So our idea was, uh, is that we cut protein into amino acids or maybe small polypeptides. We, we can easily do tripeptides or something like this. Developed uh, ab initial potentials for those uh, subunits and then try to kind of put them together into one single potential. And we can use you know, guidance from empirical potential. We can see how empirical potentials uh, look for the same structures and, you know, and they work reasonably well and uh, see what theory indicates those potentials should be. Thank you. Uh, and the question from the different point of view, how about the importance of phonons and ent entropy? on prediction algorithm? Uh, another very good question. So um, we did it for two crystals. So um, what I was uh, in, in this paper, nature communication paper, uh, at the rec rec request of one of the referees. So um, it's pretty simple thing to do in the approximation used. So what you 
all our predictions are zero K predictions. So now if you have a crystal and know what is the temperature, you have things like uh, zero point uh, energy to include and you have entropic effects. So this can be done pretty easily within those uh, periodic D DFT programs. Those things are just programs, so they have to do some geometry optimization, calculate Hessian, and then there are methods of predicting all of this. And people do it. People use Neumann group uses, other group uses it. So, so, so this is a kind of off the shell approach. We did it for two molecules. It didn't change ranking. It changed slightly, of course. Uh, I mean, it changed ranking distances, but didn't change the order. Uh, in some cases, there were there are some cases published by various people uh, adding entropic and temp temperature effect does change order of crystals, and uh, so 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 definitely this can be done. In fact, in our plans for our group, uh, when you do it, uh, say using VAS, it's actually quite time consuming. It adds a lot if you want to add temperature effects. But you can get the same thing from the force field. So it's just a question of programming exactly the same techniques which are in those periodic DFT programs based on potentials. I'm sure actually people do have it somewhere there, so you can just find some program which does it for crystals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is auto uh, PES uh, compatible with any ab initio methods? Yes, uh, yeah, I, sh I should have said it. Uh, so we use mainly SAPT, but uh, the program is kind of not restricted to this. Any program which can calculate interaction energies can be used with auto PS. And in fact, when we do calculations for small molecules, where we include large basis set extrapolations, we use then just CCSD parenthesis T, and we add corrections for full triples and non iterative quadruples, so we don't use that anymore. Although, in the ACE blind test for the largest molecule, which had 100 atom monomer, uh, 100 atoms in the monomer, uh, we could do subsequent, still do such calculations, and we did some number of points but uh, we actually develop potential using DFT plus D, not periodic DFT plus D, just you know, calculations with uh, DFT plus D for dimers and then fitting those calculations. Just a, a curiosity, I mean, how crucial is engaging also the periodic calculations? Because as far as I understood during your presentation, you said that you do not have to really engage them and you get a very reliable results. So is it really crucial to engage them? Because I understand that then you lower the computational cost quite significantly. To, to include what? Uh, periodic calculations. Because you showed the scheme and including or not including the periodic calculations. Uh, so is it- You, you, you mean just periodic DFT calculations, yes? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, so uh, at, at this, those original calculations, which we published, a year ago, uh, we have ranking, as I said, I have shown in this one graph, we have our ranking just from our force fields were between 1 and 16. And then periodic DFT on rigid crystals, just, you know, getting different uh, 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 lattice energies brought it down to number one for all first po polymorphs. So this was quite, quite important. But now we have this method of improving potential based on crystal structures generated from first version of potential. We can iterate it. And so far, we are basically getting the same. Uh, after those iterations, we get, we get number one crystals as well. So. Uh, this periodic DFT step can be avoided. But on the other hand, cost-wise, it's about the same. So it, in a sense, it's simpler to just do periodic DFT. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense also. Yeah. But also in terms of a method, I mean, you are using uh, mostly plane waves, right, for the periodic DFT calculations. 
Have you considered also another method for, for periodic calculations or, or not really? It really doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter for those crystals. And uh, I, th I think any, I mean, both quantum espresso and VASP are plane wave based, but if we use, say, crystal, which is molecular orbital based, I think the results will be the same for th those kinds of crystals. Thank you. And you are using uh, ACPT, uh, but uh, to get the total energy. But do you also somehow uh, use uh, this information that you can divide the total energy into contributions? Do you somehow design your false fields? Yeah, we, we, we independent we, terms. We do it in two ways. So one way is that we have this asymptotic calculations and this asymptotic theory is you know, like, if you know the stone book of intermolecular interactions, basically along those lines. So you get all those, you get multiple moments, but we don't stop on dipole moments. We go to dipole moments up to L equals seven. And uh, we have all those polarizabilities. So uh, then we, so, so, so we calculate for center of mass quantities. So we have to go to very large uh, uh, angular number for large systems, but then we fit it actually by a distributed analysis. And one important check is that we then do sub calculations for very large distances. So like we take 20 angstrom distance between monomers, and then uh, you can calculate sub polarization energy, and you can calculate polarization energy from the force field. The excellent way thinking that the force field is correct, and force fields are always, you know, component-based, electrostatics, polarization, dispersion. So that's one way that we use that. And the other way is that this asymptotic expansion in powers of, inverse powers of interatomic distances, of course, starts to, uh, is not good anymore for shorter distances, mainly because of charge overlap effects. So what we do and all people do is that we have those damping functions. So for example, electrostatics is not just pure dipole-dipole interaction. They are multiplied by a damping function. I mean, everybody is using this. So uh, Anna mentioned uh, those truly uh, damping functions. So we use similar ones. And then when you get to, uh, how, how do you get those damping functions? So in, uh, if you use supermolecular method like CCSD or DFT plus D to calculate intermolecular inter interaction, there's no way. But if you use SAP, you just look say electrostatic SAP component and you feed those damping parameters just to SAP components so that your electrostatic energy is a good, representation of sub electrostatic energies to quite short distance. Eventually it, it breaks. You know, if you go a little bit uh, to distances shorter than van der Waals minimum, nobody can really get any sensible answer. But for a large part of, for, for the kind of van der Waals minimum region, it works quite well. With uh, equilibrium distances, then you can go with the spherical atom approach. We, we showed it in one paper that uh, it's enough then to uh, use simple spherical representation, but continuous representation of electron density and compute penetration contribution to energy from that. Yeah, so we should do it. So uh, we, in fact, people do it. So, so the spherical atom distribution is very similar to Hirschfeld's approach, yes? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, so people doing similar calculations as we do sometimes uh, do this distribution using this kinds of methods. We could do it as well. We preferred so far using um, uh, basis set distributions, which work quite well. We published actually a couple of papers on uh, 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 basis set based distributions of dispersion energies. Um, and in our case, one more reason is that we do density fitting in all calculations. So in all kind of quantum chemistry calculations, all programs are now using density fitting. But if you use density fitting with naturally atom-based basis set, which is you know just you know density, so it's just 
yeah. three dimensional. Yeah. yeah, so so you can you can use it um, really very easily. So, but uh, um, we are thinking about you know using alternative approach, either Hirschfeld or those spherical atoms or uh, or this um, uh, stakeholder approach. Yes, I do not see anybody writing uh, questions. So let us thank uh, Anja and Krzysztof again for this really great uh, uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Uh,